So we just saw that a number of different factors lead to the evolution of larger brains. And now coming back to our human ancestors, around just before or around two million years ago, we have the first true human or sometimes or scientifically called Homo habilis. So Homo habilis had a li slightly larger brain and it most likely had the ability to speak already. Um, Homo habilis actually means handy human and Homo habilis was the our ancestor that was most efficient in creating these Alduvan tools where you would take one stone and you would chip away in a specific way at the edges of the stone to increase the, the sharpness and the utility of the stone for all sorts of ha hacking, chopping, scraping um, uh, motions and, and, and tasks. And most likely our ancestors in, in the Homo habilis line were at least able to gesture in a highly specific and useful way and may have had the ability to communicate using a proto you know like uh, language already why why do we think that they had the ability to intentionally gesture and probably had some uh, proto language or you know like some speech because these tools can't be produced and you can't really teach others to use these or to develop these tools or to make these tools without some kind of learning um, or teaching mechanism. So this is something that uh, a group around uh, Kevin Leyland, uh, Andrew Whiten and others in, in the UK set out. So they taught people, so modern humans, how to make these Aldovan stone tools. And they had a couple of different um, teaching um, strategies. The first one is you basically just show the tool and then modern humans have to reverse engineer and find out how on earth would you actually make these kind of tools. The second one is you would have a tool maker, an experienced tool maker sit next to you and you would need to imitate or emulate what the tool maker was just making. So just straightforward imitation. The, the third option is basic teaching. So the tool maker would sit there and slowly go through the process. The tool maker would not speak, would not point, but would demonstrate how to make those tools, right? So that already requires some kind of um, awareness of the developmental stages of the learner, but you, you show in a very clear and um, uh, explicit way of how to make those tools by chopping away in certain ways. The next learning strategy or teaching strategy that they used was gestures. So a learner is trying to create these tools and then the teacher would basically gesture and say or gesture and go like no 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 wait this might be the better angle or you know shift your your stone a little bit etc etc and then the last teaching strategy was actually teaching through language so verbal teaching explaining each and every step as you go along and so what they used is so-called uh, transmission chain experiments where they used each of these strategies and then looked at if you teach one student and then that student has to pass on the information to the next learner so the learner over time becomes the teacher and then passes that on the question was what kind of teaching mechanism has to be in place in order to keep the quality of these stones you know like over a number of generations of uh, learners turned teachers turned learners turned teachers etc etc and what they found is that in order to increase the quality of, of these flakes you needed to have at least 
the ability to gesture or even better you needed to have some kind of language representation in order to keep the quality of these tools uh, going forward across generations so the fact that as a, that our ancestors were able to create these very primitive stone tools they're they're primitive but nevertheless they're complex because it's not intuitive you know like the the individuals that used reverse engineering had a really hard time so the the quality was actually very very low so this suggests that you need to have some kind of teaching mechanism for that involves at least gesturing but more likely even language back then in order to keep these or to make these tools right so based on this evidence we can presume that homo habilis already had at least some kind of proto language available to pass on important information across generations so this is really really uh, an important step in our evolutionary history and then the next one in our line is Homo erectus which had already a much larger brain uh, it's nearly the size of, of modern humans and Homo erectus means the upright human so we see a couple of very specific changes in the skeleton so first of all we can already see that uh, the skull became uh, much more human like so you see you know like this kind of curved uh, uh, cranial structure the face is much flatter so that also becomes much more human already and importantly the legs the, the the legs became much larger much stronger overall which has been shown through experiments that these longer legs are very efficient for long distance locomotion so homo erectus was really well equipped to make or to explore large areas of land in a very efficient way and a second change that also happened during that time the arms became much shorter compared to previous um, previous ancestors so the the arm length were much more in line with what humans have in, in terms of the relative uh, length of arms to body ratio which suggests that homo erectus th th again you know like, um, studies have been conducted what could have been the most likely function of these these shorter arms and one suggestion is that these shorter arms are actually more well suited for for example carrying both tools but also food over longer distances so the the structure we can we can look at where muscles were attached to these arms suggests that homo homo erectus was was able to carry um, objects like uh, food like um, tools over longer distances in a more efficient way right? so these shifts in the in the skeleton structure suggest that homo erectus was a very efficient long distance traveler and was able to explore resources of a much larger uh, terrain than compared to for example homo habilis or any of our earlier australopithecus uh, ancestors so this is um, a reconstruction of one of our homo erectus ancestors so as you can see the our facial features back then are already much more human compared to you know like earlier uh, homo habilis or uh, australopithecus uh, ancestors what also happened during this time is so we're going we're looking here at homo erectus we have more complex so up here you see these different um, by the way this is uh, a graph from a really oops, from a really awesome summary that was published in 2019 on the different uh, behavioral uh, cultural and, and anatomical changes that took place over the last one million years so homo, ha homo erectus here had a much uh, more diversified um, uh, set of tools available um, there was already evidence to some extent that the later homo erectus um, ancestors would have 
for example, wooden tools. Uh, we have evidence that there was some use of symbolic representations or art symbols. Um, the use of, of coloring for body adornment, so you basically start painting your body. And, you know, like, there is some evidence that Homo erectus already had the ability to make some capes or some kind of, kind of clothing. And importantly, Homo erectus was able to control fire. So we have evidence that Homo erectus was able to control fire. So we had more sophisticated tools. So these, um, the, the so-called um, Aquilian technology, which emerged just under two million years ago, um, shows much greater sophistication. So compared to these older one tools, we can see sharper uh, edges, you know, like more refined kind of tools that would fit neatly into your hand. So we have these kind of early hand axes. And what also happens, you know, like I already talked about the brain structure changes. So, you know, like our brains uh, back then became bigger. Uh, so, you know, like there is, you know, like a larger neocortex, but also the motor areas uh, changed and the some additional changes in our body morphology also started happening around that time. So, for example, it's not enough to have, you know, like a sophisticated brain. You also need to have highly, dex highly dexterous arms and hands that are able to manipulate stones with that kind of... Um, refinement and, and uh, skill in order to create these kind of tools. So we have evidence from uh, genetic studies that during that time there were a couple of genetic changes that for example changed the ability in our wrist to make all these kind of sophisticated you know like um, wrist motions that would allow us to very fine-tune our motor movements to make these kind of changes. So larger brains is not enough you have to have um, features across the whole body, across the whole anatomy, that allow our that allowed our ancestors to create these more complex tools. So I already mentioned we had the availability of fire. So there is evidence of uh, symbolic representation. So back then, you know, like the campfires already most likely were places where people sh started to share stories, uh, there was collective learning, there was um, essentially a social living environment that was important for us to, to survive in these um, very harsh, uh, quite cold conditions. Williams and Van Schaik, they set out, um, you know, like using everything that we know about these uh, climatic um, geological changes, they tried to work out what would be what have been the kind of uh, social implications for our ancestors. So living on the forest savanna edge, so across uh, different uh, food webs, which is something that is really important. And we will talk about that in a um, in a bit more detail in a, in a second. Essentially, you need to have access to different food sources, different food webs, because if one food web becomes um, unavailable, you can then rely on another food web. So the uh, we already talked about these scarcer environments with highly patchy um, food distribution and the risk of predators. You know, like uh, one thing, you know, like if we have if we, we use sweat as a temperature regulation mechanism, uh, predators can, can smell that, right? So um, not being, you know, like not having claws, not having strong teeth, you know, like the only way we could actually avoid being, you know, attacked by predators is by uh, increasing our group sizes. So this is part of the argument that Dunbar had made as well. So Williamson and Van Schaik said there is an increased group size, greater cohesion within groups, and also an increased number of males that would go foraging around. And because we had to get, uh, we had to control these uh, predators, they argued back then we would have had an increased dimorphism in, in body size um, in order to 
protect against uh, predators and with this increased dimorphism so where males would become slightly larger and we had tools we would be able to control predators uh, more efficiently so this is you know like at the time of Australopithecus moving to uh, Homo habilis and then as we started adapting to life on an open savanna uh, more widely there were some specific changes that happened so Homo ergaster is actually just another name for Homo erectus so the first thing that they talked about is because this greater dimorphism and the human body so males being larger uh, in, in body size compared to females which would basically open up females for attack and and um, exploitation through males so what happened now is according to Williams and von Scheich is that males and females started forming coalitions that would essentially at some stage lead to the um, um, you know like to this kind of um, you know, like male female pair bonds that we see in today's humans on average um, so these male female friendships would protect females but would also now um, increase the selection pressures for females to try and attract males um, to you know like form a partnership what would happen um, in line with this is according to um, Williams and van Schaik we would have a mechanisms that would reduce sexual dimorphism again and there would be increased fission fusion dynamics so the idea here is that you know like we would have these small alliances uh, male male alliances that would forge together and then they would come back and would share food predominantly with the the female partner that would stay in the camps and would um, would forage for uh, roots tubbers etc in a more local environment and what also happened during that time with the availability of fire because you know, like uh, our brains become more costly so they are they're bigger you have need you need more energy to sustain uh, these larger brains what happened is you know like you need to get more calories but digestion is also time consuming and um, requires some energy so the best option for that is to get high calorie food for example protein that's why the idea that um, our carnivorous um, diet emerged during that time as uh, homo erectus and ideally you want to externalize part of the digestion process so the idea here is as Homo erectus started managing fire we could actually cook which is kind of an external uh, pre-digestion process which breaks down calories and makes it now easier for us to uh, uptake uh, or to, to digest these calories in a more efficient and faster way so the act or the, the performance of cooking is a pre-digestion mechanism so it's a cultural tool that allowed us to ingest more calories in a more efficient way um, they also argued that in these larger groups now um, similar to the social brain hypothesis we m switched from a kind of co competitive a chimpanzee like uh, social group structure to a more collaborative uh, psychology uh, we have male-based cooperative hunting um, basically the whole stack hunt problem you know like where where individuals have to cooperate with each other uh, males typically cooperate with each other to get to a larger um, animal that would feed everyone and you could divide that rather than each uh, smaller group you know going after a smaller uh, rabbit or hare right so this is the classic kind of stack hunt uh, cooperative um, problem and of course with these male female friendships um, there was the development of pair bonds with an onset of division of labor where males would um, 
essentially forage further away, um, get the 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 meat based uh, contribution to the food, and females would stay closer to the camp and extract uh, basically plant based food. So this is um, an argument that is one example of the argument, but the there are a couple of other theories that pretty much suggest this Homo erectus period was a crucial period in our human development because with these geological uh, climatic changes, the opening up of the grassland, these larger um, grass eaters that now started roaming around the savanna opened up um, different food sources that could be exploited by Homo erectus through collective uh, hunting strategies and with that came all sorts of different social changes within those um, camps. And Homo erectus was also the first la uh, the first um, hominin to move out of Africa and we have evidence that Homo erectus moved around in various um, waves so in the earlier waves that have been um, reconstructed based on uh, fossil records, Homo erectus, most likely out of East Africa, moved into Asia and then in higher um, areas, um, avoiding larger predators to, to the extent possible and um, always following typically the the edges of, of different food webs so following rivers or following coastlines or following the savanna bushland um, borders would move all the way down to what is today um, Indonesia Malaysia Singapore to this area within a very fast period and then there would be later uh, periods where Homo erectus would for example uh, move into Europe and what is very interesting if you look at the trajectory of that movement Homo erectus at that time would be able to move further north so most likely had developed the ability for example to um, manufacture cloth to compensate for that cold uh, climate you have to remember this is the period of the ice ages so it was a very tough environment that needed some um, very careful protection against these this cold weather and also followed higher altitudes so you know like moved in in higher altitudes where there there are more rocks available which suggests that these higher altitudes the the rock outcrops that are more readily available in these areas would allow Homo erectus easier access to all the raw material to create these tools so which suggests that these tools became more and more important um, the more recent these waves happened out of Africa and, and the fact that Homo erectus later on during the ice age um, in the last uh, uh, couple of hundred thousand years was able to move in these very very cold areas in, in northern Europe suggests that by that time Homo erectus was able to was able to master a very sophisticated set of cultural tools to make uh, or to exploit the very hostile environment during that time and so we have evidence you know like about 1.6 million years ago for example Peking men um, that our ancestors essentially had colonized um, the areas of um, large parts of Africa, Europe and Asia. So Homo erectus, if you think about it, is probably the most, um, if you think about the long time span that Homo erectus has been around, it's probably the most successful human to date you know like if you look at our um, our human line homo sapiens we haven't been around for that long and homo erectus has been around for a very very long period and was able to survive and adapt to all these diverse areas um, in in the old world so that's a pretty major achievement but then came the wise human homo sapiens and this is what we're going to look at 
in the next section.